resurrection and is coming back again. We believe so. Christian Church. <laughs> Let's try that again. Cut. Roll. Action. Okay. Good morning, Milan Christian Church. That's a little better. Anyway, good morning. Y'all know I'm obviously kidding around. Good morning. Welcome home as always. Um, however you want to join us in worshiping God, standing or sitting, that's between you and the Lord. Close like no one 
good father, isn't he? Amen. Amen. So I wanted to read some scripture to you this morning. By the way, you notice I got a new guitar player today. Um, my dad is at what's called the uh, Peoria Great Banquet. Um, it's a weekend conference. Um, one weekend they do the men, the other weekend they do the women. It's a time to reflect and connect with God off of social media, out of, you know, the busyness of life. And um, so he's leading worship with them today. So I ask that you just say a prayer for him and um, know that he's doing other great things today besides being with us. Um, but Psalm 99.3 says, let them praise your great and awesome name for he is holy. No greater truth, I think, has been spoken than the words our God is an awesome God. Amen. Um, throughout history, there have been some men and women who have done some great things. Um, a few have changed the way things are done, helping mankind as a whole. Some have discovered ways to help those who are sick or to make things easier for people. Some have led nations into doing great things. Um, people who have done these things are honored in different ways. Some have their own special day on a calendar each year. Some have had statues made of them. Museums have been built to remember what they have done. People all over praise them for great things. While these men and women have often done great things, most of these things are temporary. They will not last for eternity. In the psalm, people are encouraged to praise the Lord's name for he is great and awesome. In itself, the name God, Lord, or Jesus doesn't mean a whole lot. It's just a name. False gods have taken on these names, and some, some people have even taken on these names. But the name of God is more when it's looked at with the nature of God. The Lord is holy, and he's worthy of praise. God has created everything. The Lord has provided for the forgiveness of our sins, and he offers eternal life. What greater thing is there than that? Death is the greatest enemy of mankind. No man is able to overcome it. The only reason that there is death is because of sin. But Jesus has overcome death so that each person has a chance to be saved and overcome it as well. With having done this, there is no one worthy of more praise and honor than Jesus in all of history. I'd like you to take a moment to think about what Jesus has done for you. Just the fact that he has removed all of our sins and has given us eternal life is enough of his worthy, he is enough to be worthy of our praise forever. God has not only given us eternal life, he gives you joy, he gives us peace, he provides for what we need. And this next song we're going to do, you all know it, and we're all going to sing together, our God is an awesome God. He's smart, he's wise. He is mighty and powerful. He is a loving God. Amen. Amen. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power. Oh, God. 
overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. you in this house today. Lord, as Britain comes forth, we ask that you just be with him, help him to bring forth your message, help our hearts to be open to hear what you have to say to us. And Lord, we just thank you for being an awesome, great, mighty, wonderful, powerful God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
Well, good morning, church. Man, plenty of room after Easter, huh? Hey, we are in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 19. We're picking up right where we left off last week. We've been going through the Gospel of John, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And what we're going to see today is, is that Jesus transforms people that believe in him. Uh, I, I started to believe around the time I was 16, I was baptized at 17, and man, I was a terrible kid. I was the kid that everyone wanted to hang out at my house because my parents weren't home, and I knew how to get away with stuff. And for a large part of my life, I was chaotic and manipulative and narcissistic and selfish. And you can debate that I'm still some of those things today, but man, if you knew me before... And Jesus Christ came into my life, and it began to change me. Look, and it wasn't all at once. I didn't have a burning bush mo moment. God did not, you know, uh, come to speak to me in a dream and, you know, call me up to the fourth heaven. None of that. It was a choice I made to put my faith and trust in Jesus and start walking along that path. And, and I can look back to that moment. That's when everything began to change. And over the last, oh, I don't know. Let's see, that was 17, I'm 42 now, a long time ago. I'm not good at, <laughs> I went to public school. I'm not the best at math. So 20-ish 20 20 -ish years ago, I can look back and be like, man, that was God. That was God. That was God. And see how God worked and moved and changed my life and brought me to where, where I am today. You know, and it's one of the, as, as a pastor, one of the thing, one of the best parts about being a pastor is getting to see how God works in your life, getting to see how God works in your marriage, getting to see God work in your children. Because I do, I get to see people at their worst moments when they're broken and empty and in the gutter. And I get to see people at their best moments. You know, there, uh, I, I remember uh, several, several years ago, uh, I was cleaning my garage and a semi truck pulls up and some guy jumps out of it and he starts running towards me. And he's like 6'8", 6'9". Now, when you're that tall to me, you might as well be 10 foot tall because down here, everybody looks huge. <laughs> You know, probably 375 pounds, and he's running up. And he had just visited our church before, and I was like, what, is he coming here to kill me, or does he have a Bible? Which team is he on? I'm not sure. You know, and he runs up, and he's like, I've been sinning. I'm like, oh, this is one of those times. And he was crying, just weeping. And he gets down on his knees, and he's about head height with me at that point. And he's like, I've been smoking, I've been drinking, I've been going to prostitute, and he just starts listing off all of these sins, and he's weeping and crying, and uh, at that moment, I was like, all right, you know, we, we need to call your wife. He's like, she's not my wife, I lied. She's my girlfriend. You know, and when we, we, we call her, and he's like, you know, um, this man wants to give his life to Christ. You know, we came up here, and we, we baptized him that Sunday, and he was so big, you know, we had to get him on his knees and push him back. You know, water splashed out, it flooded the basement. And, and I'll never forget that time because I barely knew this guy, and he just started confessing all this, this deepest, darkest secret, secrets. And that decision to follow Jesus, it cost him that relationship. It was over within a month. It cost him his, his home, his job. It cost him about everything he had, where he had to load up what literally did have into a truck and drive it back to Texas. You know, I, I talked to him today. Or not today, this week, sorry. I talked to him earlier this week. He's a pastor of a small church in Texas. Oh, wow. You know, I, I've seen God do amazing things in people's lives. You know, not everyone has a testimony like that. But he was transformed by the grace of God. And sometimes when you hear stories like that, you say, oh, I wish I had a story like that because my story is no good. You know, my parents love Jesus, and I love Jesus from an early age, and my kids love Jesus. That is an incredible testimony because it means that God's word is true, that God has been working and moving in your life since you were a child, and that this is true. It works. And here's the deal. The earlier you accept Christ in your life and you keep following him, the more different you are going to be from the world around you. Because however, whenever you come to Christ, if you really come to Jesus, then you are transformed. As we study the text today, we're going to see, we're going to see the disciples change 
from fear to courage. We're going to see Thomas change from unbelief to confidence. And as we look at the changes that take place in the lives of others, I want you to ask yourself, have I personally met the risen Christ? Has he changed my life? Do I, am I pursuing a relationship with Jesus, or do I just have religion? Let's jump into the text. Pick it up in verse 19. On that evening, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands inside. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Now, notice what is it in the text. It doesn't say, you know, they were locked in their rooms because they were so bold. <laughs> Jesus didn't show up and go, you miserable failures, what's wrong with you? Th that's all missing. They're locked in a room because they're afraid. And the idea is, if they can do that to Jesus, they can do that to any one of us. And as his men are cowering in fear, that's when Jesus shows up. How do you get in the door? You know, I don't picture him climbing through a window. He's not a 12-year-old boy. After the resurrection, time and space are done differently. Jesus isn't bound by those things anymore. And one day, when you are raised, if you're in Christ, you won't be bound by them either. He didn't open the door. He manifested himself among them. Yes, they crucified his body. But they cannot crucify the soul. Jesus is the resurrection in the life. And in much of Jewish tradition, the dead would be resurrected in the same form which they died, so you would recognize who they were. Now, the wounds, though, they're meant more than for identification. They were evidence. A price has been paid for salvation. And they are the promise that men can have peace with God. There's at least five times in the New Testament that Jesus shows up on the first day of the week. That's the day the church met. In fact, that's why the early church started praying, Maranatha. That means come, Lord Jesus, inviting him to come and be amongst them as they worship him. And, and look at the disciples' reaction. It says they're overjoyed. So they're cowering in fear. And then there's a change. All of a sudden, they're overjoyed. Now, Jesus told them in John 16 that their grief would turn to joy. This is the moment he's referring to. And joy is different than happiness. Happiness comes from what's happening. There is a joy that persists through suffering and persecution. The first transformation that takes place in the text is this one, where their fear is turned into courage. Jesus is their courage. Jesus is their boldness. He's raised to life. And there's a context to here, and this is important, because the most repeated command in the Bible is do not be afraid. But there's a context to this. It's not just don't be afraid. It's don't be afraid even when there's something to be afraid of. See, this has a worrying aspect to it because you worry about your health and you worry about this sickness and you worry about your job and you worry about your children. And that worry leads to fear and you wonder, what if? The context here is don't be afraid even when there's something to be afraid of. Courage has many forms. They're not worried about this life because they've seen the resurrection and the life. They no longer fear death because you can't scare someone that's seen the resurrected Jesus. And they will spend the rest of their lives following Jesus and all but one will be martyred for, for their faith, but they are never gonna lose their joy. You can't take it away because Jesus is alive. Verse 21, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Now, because Jesus' disciples were no longer of the world, they no longer belong to the world, he's sending them back into the world to bear witness. He did not come back to get them. He came back to commission them. After their fear turned to joy, Jesus gives them a new purpose. He puts them on mission. Despite their many failures, Jesus is trusting them with the word 
with his word and work. And this is amazing. I want you to think about this. Jesus gave these 11 guys a mission to take his word and tell his story to the world. He drafted Paul a little bit into it because they weren't getting it done fast enough. And they told people about Jesus. And those people told people about Jesus. And those people told people about Jesus until somebody told you about Jesus. He entrusted those 11 guys. Their fear, you see their fear turn to courage. You see them have this incredible joy and he gives them a new mission, a new purpose. Something people ask me periodically is what is God's will for my life? Here's a better question. You know, what's God's will for you today? Do the next right thing. Do the next bad thing. And then the meta narrative here, part of your purpose is to bring people into relationship with Jesus. You're all different. You have different gifts, different abilities. So do these guys. And they work in different ways, but they're all working towards the same ends. And that's to bring people into relationship with Jesus Christ. You got to remember, your mission or the mission that Jesus gives his disciples is not the same as Jesus' mission on earth. Jesus came to give us everlasting life, to free us from the slavery and sin. You're not here to die for other people's sins. You're called to die to yourself. You're not asked to sacrifice your son, but to raise your son in the way of the Lord. Jesus accomplished his mission, and he's given you another one. Now, this comes from Matthew 28. And this is all over our printed documentation. This is what the, our vision and, and mission as a church is. It's on the walls, on banners out there. It says this. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Our mission is not just evangelism. That's, that's a large part of it. It embraces everything that we do to be like Jesus. We're to be salt. That's a preservative. We're to be light. Th that shit that puts, that reveals darkness. Sometimes people try to separate their lives in the different spheres, right? And you're one person at work and you're one person at home. You're, you're one person at church. Look at this. We are always to be on mission. Every time you walk out that door, you're entering the mission field. And, God, and there are opportunities all around you to share how Jesus transformed and changed your life. So we see that with the 11. When they come into a real relationship with Jesus, he, they're transformed and they're given a new purpose. He's not done. Verse 22. And with that... He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive their sins, they're not forgiven. So when he breathes the Holy Spirit on them, he is equipping them for the mission he's given them. The breath of God in the first creation meant physical life. And the breath of Jesus Christ in the new creation means spiritual life. So Jesus gives them the Spirit and he sends them out. The Holy Spirit is going to help them get the gospel to the world. Now, on verse 23, you could preach a whole sermon. Some people and religions build an entire system on verse 23. The most popular of which is that you have to have your sins forgiven by a delegate of the vicar of Christ. That power flows from the Pope to the Cardinal, to the Bishop, to the priest, and that's how sins are forgiven. And it's hard for me to read that without laughing. You built that entire hierarchy on one verse? Well, what about the rest of Scripture? Or John's entire gospel? You can read for yourself what the apostles took that verse to mean in the book of Acts. Acts through Revelation is the explanation of the gospels. We interpret the gospels, we understand the gospels through the lens of the rest of, of Scripture. So when these guys go out, they're preaching the gospel and they declare that if you repent and are baptized, you will be saved. Peter says that in the first sermon in Acts chapter 2, verse 23. And he says, it's a promise from God for you, for your children, 
for your children's children, and all who are far off. You see, the disciples did not provide forgiveness. They proclaimed forgiveness on the basis of the message of the gospel. It's God who forgives sins. God alone. They're simply the evangelists. They pronounce the forgiveness of sins that's being offered by God. And they also pronounce the antecedent that if you do not put your faith in Christ, you're going to be eternally condemned. See, you cannot buy this forgiveness, though charlatans try to sell it. It's only offered through faith in Jesus. In Christ alone, our salvation lies. It's what Christ did on the cross that forgives sins. Nothing is asked of us throughout John's gospel but to believe that and follow him. Now, what really upsets me is when a baby dies or a loved one's taken off life support, you can pay a priest to come in and sprinkle them, yeah. pronounce their sins forgiven, and at that point, people are so hurt and so desperate to have peace, they will do anything. So the priest comes in and collects the fee. He says the right. He gives them a certificate declaring their sins forgiven. Look, there is no forgiveness apart from faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way. That's the only way. All that a Christian can do is announce the message of forgiveness. God performs the miracle of forgiveness. Verse 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord! But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. Now, historically, we call this man Doubting, yeah, Doubting Thomas. Now, I think we should call him Practical Thomas because he's on the side of truth. He only believes what's in truth. He saw Jesus crucified. They had a, theor, a spear thrust through his heart. He doesn't believe Jesus is alive. It's not that he's uncommitted. Earlier, when Jesus was going to go and raise Lazarus, Thomas said, hey, how about we all go and we'll die with him. If they're going to kill him, they can kill us. He's brave, he's a, but he's a realist. He doesn't believe Jesus is alive. He, saw, he knows he's dead. Now, Didymus means twin. Who's twin? Well, it might be you. I was his twin at one point in my life. I doubted that God loved me. I doubted that God cared. I wasn't sure what I believed, but I didn't believe in Jesus because I didn't know him. And, and additionally, Thomas is a good warning to all of us not to miss out with meeting with God's people on the Lord's Day because you never know what's going to happen. This is from Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. See, Thomas skipped church. He wasn't there. And so what did he miss out on? He missed out on seeing Jesus. He missed out on hearing Jesus say twice, peace be with you. He missed out on the breath of God. He missed out on the commission and the spiritual gift. And so he doesn't have that same joy that the others have. You're going to see in a minute the door's still locked. I bet that's because Thomas was going over there and snapping the lock back. He still has the fear. Remember Thomas when you're tempted to stay home from church because you never know on what spiritual blessing you can miss out on from being here. Verse 26. A week later, what that's a week later, Seven days. His disciples were in the house again. Thomas was with them. And then notice right after it says Thomas was with them, the door was locked. Remember, because they're courageous now. They have the Holy Spirit now. A few of them are about to get beat real good in the name of Jesus, and they're going to praise God. But Thomas hasn't seen that yet. He hasn't had his fear turn to joy. I don't know for sure, but I'm betting he's the one that walked over there and locked that door. I could be wrong. But it, it makes sense. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. 
Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. For a week, they had to listen to Mr. Empirical say, I don't believe it unless I see it. You know, he's feeling confident in his unbelief as time passes. And then Jesus shows up. I can just picture all the color draining out of Thomas's face. And transformation is a process that never ends. Do, do you understand that Jesus works with just a little bit of faith? All you have to do is have a little bit of faith, and he can work with that. And he says, with that little bit of faith, he can do amazing things. He works with our unbelief. Because sometimes people would say, if Jesus isn't Lord of everything in your life, then he's not Lord at all. I, I don't believe that. Jesus works with you right where you're at. Scripture says that Jesus finds a smoldering wick and he doesn't snuff it out. That he finds a bruised reed and he doesn't break it. See, Jesus can work with you wherever you're at. The Hebrew idiom for faith is a walk. You start somewhere and you walk towards God the rest of your life. Now, sometimes that walk slows to a crawl. And then sometimes you stumble and you fall down and sometimes you take other people with you. But that doesn't mean God is done with us. It's not like God is looking down and go, look what you did. You made the mess. You deal with it. I'm done with you. He works with you wherever you're at, just like Thomas. See, here's the thing. Everybody lives by faith. The question is, who or what is your faith in? The difference is the, the object of your faith. For the Christian, we put our faith in God, His Word. And unsaved people, they put their faith in their government and themselves. It's all a matter of faith. I was just going through this with my small group recently, and because somebody said, well, I believe in science. Look, and, and, and we were talking about the Darwin's theory of evolution. Well, that theory was written in the 1800s. It's an old theory, and it hasn't stood the test of time. But people talk about it because they went to public school and they think it's a fact. It's not. It's just a theory, and it's been disproven. Modern molecular biology has reached a point of irreducible complexity where things couldn't have just happened over time. Just for instance, let's take blood clotting. That's something we're all familiar with. How could a blood clotting developed slowly over time. It's hundreds of factors. And if one is broken, you're hemophiliac. Why does your blood clot? What starts it? What stops it? Why does your blood clot when it's in your body? All of these factors point to irreducible complexity. And see, science doesn't tell us anything. Scientists do. And if they find evidence that points that their theory is impossible, do they look and say, well, we're designed a certain way. That must mean there's a designer. No, they double down on their unbelief. Here's what you need to know. Everybody lives by faith. Is your faith in God or yourself? How do you know what you think you know is really real? How do you know that's true and you're not just living off somebody else's faith? It all comes down to faith. Verse 28, Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you've seen me, you believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Friends, that is us. We believed even though we didn't see. And after believing, our eyes are opened and we saw. I once was blind, but now I see. I've experienced the goodness of the word of God. Man, and what I love this is we see this throughout chapter 20. Jesus meets people where they're at. Mary is distraught, crying, yelling. He appears to her. Thomas skipped church when Jesus showed up. He doesn't believe. And Jesus came and appeared to him. Look, God is moving and working in your life. He's nudging you. He's giving you signs. He's pointing you back to himself. Jesus works with you right where you're at. And Thomas started the day as Eeyore. Right? And, he ends it, and he ends the day as Tigger. He's excited. 
He's filled with joy again because it's not over, because it's true, because the gospel is true, because Jesus is alive. It's not over. This is only the beginning. He didn't waste his life. But there's a lot of people today who are like Thomas. They believe, but they don't belong to the community of faith. Or, or they believe, but they don't follow. There's a difference between faith and belief. See, unfortunately, in, in the Greek language, it's the same word for belief and faith. It's pistos. But we use them differently. We use belief like, oh, I believe, you know, it could happen. I believe it could. It might be true. That's how we use belief. Like, I believe the Packers could win the Super Bowl next year. Right? A lot of you believe the Bears could, which is crazy. You have way more faith, way more belief than I do. But I wouldn't bet my house on it. I believe it, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lean into that. See, that's what faith is. It's it's leaning into something. Like I believe this could hold me. Right? If I leaned into it, I don't know, I'm a big dude. But if I put some weight on this, this is faith. It's leaning into it, resting on it. We use belief and faith the same way, but I really think they're different. There is a man, he's a tightrope walker. He's going to push a wheelbarrow across Niagara Falls. And they'd ask people, they'd be like, do you think he could do it? Do you think he could do it? And like, yeah. Yeah, I believe he could. I believe he will. And then they'd say, would you ride in the wheelbarrow? <laughs> Seems like an unnecessary risk. <laughs> no. That's the difference. Faith is getting in the wheelbarrow. It's trusting in Christ alone. It's not believing that Jesus existed. It's trusting in him alone. It's getting into the wheelbarrow. It's surrendering your life and taking your life and putting it in his hands. That's the difference. Now, Jesus says, if you do that, in our verse, you'll be blessed. That, that blessed in verse 29 is the same kind of blessed we see in the Sermon on the Mount. It means the joy of God. There's a joy you can have from following Jesus that money can't buy and taxes can't take away. But it only comes to those who truly surrender, who truly believe. 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9 says this, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Is that you? Though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is unexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is what Thomas is experiencing the moment he sees Jesus. And this is what I started to experience after being baptized in his name. I went from believing in Jesus to putting my faith and trust and him alone for the forgiveness of my sins. And this is what we want to offer you today. You don't have to waver between faith and belief. You don't have to wonder if you're saved or not. You can choose this day to surrender to Jesus, to be baptized in his name, and start walking in everlasting life. You don't have to wonder. Verse 20, verse 30 and 31. This is the last two verses in chapter 20. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. John is an old man when he's writing this, and I can just picture this. Like, I'm not writing this all down. Enough. <clears throat> but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the summary of of Johannian theology. This is what everything in the Gospel of John is about. That you would have faith in Jesus. And by having faith, you'd have everlasting life. You know, sometimes people will ask me, how come Jesus didn't do this or say that? How come he didn't address these social justice issues? First of all, Jesus was only here for 33 years. And second of all, all of those issues that people are concerned about in our day, they were, not a concern, they were not part of his mission or concern. See, there's a lot of things that you worry about, so many things that you worry about that won't matter a month from now, let alone a year, and not at all when compared to eternity. 
These things were written so you can have new life in the name of Jesus, for you to believe in the name of Jesus and be saved. And as you read John's gospel, you come face to face with Jesus, how he lived, what he said, what he did, how he loved people. All the evidence points to the conclusion that he is indeed God come in the flesh, the Savior of the world. And when people trusted him, they had their lives transformed. And we see it. The ten disciples, they went from fear to courage. Thomas is, went from unbelief to confidence. And now John, in the very last verse, is inviting you to put your trust in Christ and be changed from death to life from grief to joy, where you don't have to worry about what happens when I die, and you don't need to fear what happens tomorrow because your faith and trust rest in a resurrected Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit Lord, would fill us, that you would give us confidence and joy and, and, and a faith that overcomes all fear. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Hey, in a moment, we're about to take communion together. And uh, I know it's weird to come to church and get yelled at for 20 minutes and you might have some questions about what we talked about today and i just want to encourage you to ask those questions hey we give a handout every week of all the bible verses we used there's also questions at the bottom of that for you to try to take this message and apply it to your life so i want to encourage you that if you're here with somebody today and you listen to this to answer those questions together, to be honest with yourself, with God. And if you have other questions, man, seek me out. I'd, I'd be happy to, to talk to you ab about them. I said, we're, hold on, we're, we're about to take communion and I'd do a disservice if I didn't tell you that when you get that bread, that represents Jesus' body, which was nailed to the cross for you. When you get that cup, that's his blood that was pouring out on the ground for you. And the reason we take communion every week is so we never forget the price that was paid for us to be forgiven. If you've ever wondered, does God love you? Look at the cross. If you've ever wondered, does he care? Look at the cross. When you eat that bread and drink that cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death till he comes. That means that you believe that Jesus died in your place for your sins and that he's going to come back one day. Hey, we practice open communion for all believers. You don't have to go to church here and do some song and dance. But I ask that uh, when you get the cup, you hold on to it. And after everyone's served, I'll pray. And we'll all take communion together as one body, one church, one family in Jesus Christ.
we're gonna, Jan's gonna do announcements in a second. Uh, Why she's doing that, we're gonna take up an offering. Yay, I love offering time. Hey, offerings are act of worship. And if, but if you're a guest with here, us today, please don't feel obligated to give. We are just glad you're here. Amen? Amen. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> Uh, just a few announcements this morning. Uh, the marriage retreat, uh, as you probably know, it was extended to register till today. So you have one more chance to register if you'd like to attend, uh, get with Amy or J Jim Mitchell. Uh, also, the graduate recognition for, will be in the newsletter next month. Uh, the deadline for that is April 10th, so you need to get the information into Heather before then. Um, Elderberries is coming up. <laughs> and you want to say something? Good morning. <laughs> you have to realize that this fabulous church has a great minister, wonderful, wonderful musicians, and great cooks. <laughs> this Tuesday at 1130, we are enjoying a ham and salad spring luncheon. You are all invited. We start exactly at 1130, and you're out the door by 1230. You don't even have to do dishes. <laughs> We're doing potato salad for Jim, but everybody is invited, and there's lots of food, lots of fun, Lots of great friends. We do it for faith. Please join us. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there's also uh, this month the uh, ladies' lunch, or ladies' brunch, is canceled because we've got a MCC men's breakfast that day at the church, and that will be on the 20th of April. And that's also including a community cleanup day. So be sure to come to that. Um, also, um, you can see all of these announcements. Be sure to check your, your connections. And there, there are more things, too, in the connections. And if you haven't already, check our Facebook page. Uh, because everything that comes up is on that page. So thank you.